Can I just add my welcome uh, to you all coming to this today's seminar? Um, it's taken place obviously in the context of a very uh, important exhibition of the work of Andy Warhol. Um, and the depth and range of the work is very typical of the way the Hugh Lane approaches retrospective exhibitions. And I think it's an important exhibition for the gallery and I think for the context in Ireland. Um, Obviously, in thinking about the seminar, I've been thinking about why it is that Warhol work, Warhol, Warhol's works continue to hold our attention uh, well into the 20, 21st century. Um, it's not just a question of the market. I don't think it's just a question of celebrity uh, or the vir use of viral social media um, in, in conveying the, the sort of imagery with which he works. Uh, I think it's to do with a dynamic that's actually at the center of the art process, uh, has been at the center of the art process uh, since the late 20th century. And that is a dialectic between uh, the temple and the forum. And by temple, I mean the, the context, uh, uh, the Greek or Roman models of, of, of the temple that one could only gain access through a priesthood, uh, an elevated context. Um, and the forum is the, in, in contrast to that, is the space for social interaction and political discourse. Uh, it was the forum in Rome, the Agora in um, Athens. Um, and it's interesting, I think, a modern, a, a contemporary example of that uh, dichotomy is the uh, Tate Gallery in London. For instance, Tate Britain, if you know the building, the columns, you, you, you enter via steps, you are raised up into the museum, as it were, over the steps. And then you have uh, Tate Modern, where you descend, as it were, on a ramp uh, into the turbine hall, which is a social interactive space, uh, which is free access, in a sense. Um, and then you move on through other parts of the museum. But it's two interesting models there that work in, in relation to each other. But at the center of that is that dialectic, I think, between temple and forum. And unlike many artists, uh, since the time when museums were defined as, became defined as a place apart, um, uh, many artists have to work on either side of that fault line. Um, but in fact, Andy Warhol inhabits the fault line, I, I, I would argue. His practice actually embodies a dialogue uh, between the temple and the forum, between what is so-called low art and so-called high art. Um, because Warhol brought the forum inside the temple. Um, and it's not, it, it isn't just a matter of material. It's actually an ideological process. Uh, so it's not a matter of form. The issue is not about the form of the work. It's the ideology and the purpose of the work. Uh, the writer Thomas Crowe, in an article after Warhol's death um, in Art in America, talked about three ways of looking at Warhol and dealing with Warhol. One is the persona, Andy Warhol, and the celebrity associated with that, quite deliberately created. Uh, the second was the body of work, paintings, prints, films. And the third was, as Thomas Crowe put it, the ways in which Warhol sanctioned experiments in non-elite non culture beyond the world of art. And he talked of these as a, as a set of conscious strategies in a total art practice. And I think we should remember that Andrew Warhol created Andy Warhol in just as conscious an act as Andy Warhol created paintings and prints of Marilyn Monroe or Interview Magazine, for that matter. So I think what we're going to hear in the discussion today is, um, is about the issues around these strategies and the outworkings of this dialogue, this dialectic that uh, I think exists in relation to evolving ideas of art production uh, in the studio or the factory, uh, art distribution in museums, uh, or galleries, or the street, and also fresh ideas of participation um, and shared agency. 
Because I think, and I would argue very strongly, that shared agency is key to Warhol's work. When it is understood as part of a long cyclical art process over the whole human project, rather than just uh, over the short linear art process of modernity. Because Warhol was not dependent on the modernist idea of the solo agency of the artist. In this sense, Warhol is not actually a modernist at all. Uh, to be framed as simply a next new thing in a linear uh, progression. Because Warhol was pulling on threads of meaning about the nature and meaning of human experience uh, in art production, distribution, and participation that go beyond the European and American models of modernity and validation that have been put in place uh, quite deliberately since the 17th century. So like all great art, Warhol's work is cyclical in meaning because it destroys time. And that's why it's so legible. I think that's why it's so participatory. And that's why it repays our continued attention in the present tense. Um, now, having claimed that uh, Warhol's work destroys time, uh, as chairman, I won't be allowing the speakers today any such privilege. Uh, they'll be kept very rigorously to time. I've probably gone over time anyway myself and broken the rule. Uh, but we'll start today now, and I'll introduce uh, Barbara Dawson. The first speaker is Barbara Dawson, uh, obviously the director of the Hugh Lane Gallery, who has led the gallery uh, to become one of the leading places for the uh, presentation and collection of historical and contemporary art in Ireland. Um, Barbara is an historian who has written many texts and curated many exhibitions on historical uh, and contemporary art. Barbara. Thank you very much, uh, Declan, and I hope I'll have about two minutes because I want to just welcome everybody as well. So give me, uh, thank you. You're all very welcome here this morning and um, on behalf of the Hugh Lane Gallery team and particularly on behalf of my co-curator, Michael Dempsey. Where are you? Michael is there. Uh, you're all very welcome and I'd also like to thank all of the speakers who have traveled here for uh, this seminar today. I think that's enough. Just before we start, um, I'd just like us to remember uh, Oliver Darling. Oliver Darling uh, passed away yesterday. He was a visionary and a wonderful leading light in contemporary visual arts in Ireland. Um, uh, he was a former board member of uh, Hugh Lane Gallery. He was a member of ROSC. He also set up the Oliver Darling Gallery and was the first person and brought Joseph Boyce to Ireland. Uh, he led a very full and uh, engaging life, and I know that had he been well, he would be here today, and we all miss him terribly. So may he rest in peace, and my condolences to his partner, Alan, and to all of his family. Um, uh, this morning, uh, I'm discussing three, three artists, um, very interesting about the cyclical nature of, of work and the destruction of time, and uh, also how artists approach uh, the work in the, particularly I'm concentrating around the 1970s with Andy Warhol, Peter Beard, and Francis Bacon. Um, this actually started to come about because of archive. Um, as we were working on Andy Warhol exhibition, we were looking at the work of Peter Beard, who was a very close friend of Andy Warhol's in extending out the understanding of this artist. And therefore, then I started to look at the archive of Andy Warhol in, um, in Pittsburgh. Uh, they were very helpful to me there. And I discovered some very interesting new material on between Warhol, dialogue between Warhol and Bacon. And of course, we have the great Bacon archive here as well. So on the superficially, you may think uh, an older painter, figurative painter, and the Andy Warhol that we'd know, what would they have in common, and what was their, 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 their coming together. And in fact, when you look at it, you see they have quite a lot. Um, in, in common is in the world, but their, their drive and their, their uh, ambition and their vision for, for the visual arts is, is, it can be quite similar in the sense of being iconoclastic in certain ways and wanting to, to move the art beyond its cur current status. 
Andy met uh, Peter Beard uh, in 1964 in uh, New York at a time when rebellion defined who you are and the underground art movement challenged the narrow confines of conventionalities of 1960s society. They actually met at the Mikas Brothers underground screening of Jean Genet's um, uh, homoerotically um, and highly original uh, film Un Chant de Moore. So that's the first place they met, and um, this was, of course, a very exciting time in New York, but it was kind of also a rather, if you like, dangerous time, or in, insofar as Mikos was arrested after that streaming, as Enchant de Moore was banned in the States. But both Warhol and Bacon and Beard uh, shared a passion for experimental filmmaking. And Warhol and Beard were regulars at the Mikas Brothers uh, weekend screenings. In fact, Warhol screened Sleep, which is uh, over here uh, in 1963 at one of their weekend film screenings and later on Empire, which we also have here. Uh, and in fact, when they heard that Empire was eight and a half hours long, apparently Jonas Mikas tied uh, Warhol to a chair and tried to defy, to defy him to sit there for the whole eight and a half hours. <laughs> Uh, Peter Beard starred in a comedy of the Acerb, Hallelujah to the Hills, which was uh, directed by Adolphus Mikas, and it became the landmark of new American film. In it, the handsome Peter Beard, naked, blackened skin, romps through pure white snow. So you get the idea. That's what, what a sight. Um, when Beard met um, Andy, he described him as, as he thought he was a freak. He was dressed all in leather, he was very white and slightly scary. And nonetheless, the younger Beard began to frequent the uh, factory and st struck up a long time, long life uh, friendship with uh, the artist. Beard was an artist and a photographer, and quite a non-conventional photographer uh, from a wealthy industrial uh, American family. All his life, he displayed a creative, restless psyche which embraced life with an exhilarated nihilism, or other like what Bacon would say, life is so, um, uh, life, there's, life is meaningless, so you might as well be extraordinary. Um, in the fast-paced, ever-changing world of the 1960s, Beard moved easily between Manhattan's celebrity milieu and the terrains of East Africa. In fact, he was first brought to East Africa by uh, Quentin Keynes, who was a great-great-grandson of um, uh, Darwin, and they went in the mid-50s to document the habitat and the behavior of the black and white rhinos. The reason um, I, I say this is because it really opened up Peter Beard's eyes to one, the documentary, the camera, and how Keynes had replaced the gun with the camera. Because up to then, it was heroic for the white man to go and uh, uh, shoot and indeed sometimes slaughter an uh, enormous amount of wild animals and bring home uh, trophy heads. But the camera, of course, was a way of documenting and understanding and becoming to terms with this fa fascinating and magnificent terrain. So he, uh, Peter Beard, after that, had a lifelong crusade against big game hunting, a profound belief of man as animal, also shared by Francis Bacon, and before it was ever seen as a crucial issue, the sustainability of the continent, continent's fragile ecosystem, which were being eroded by progress, industrialization, and, and you know, um, if you like, development. So he, in the 50s, 60s, bought a farm called Hog Ranch, which is a collection of tents uh, in the foothills of the Grand Mountains outside Nairobi. But he's... Um, he's uh, he's he's, he's uh, collected his photography, and really he also, as well as the magnificence of the animals and the beauty of it, he also showed, if you like, the underbelly, the savagery uh, of, 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 of the animals, the difficulties and the challenges of the life, and, um, and created an empathy with it. It was really him showing a visceral experience where death is accepted with equanimity and danger is all at hand. And so he captured that wildlife in a fantastic book called The End of the Game, The Last Word for Paradise. It was published in 1963 and it brought him huge success. It sort of blew the whistle on big game hunting and started a notion of conservation of, of wildlife in Africa. In the 1977 edition, he caused a furore with these additional of a final chapter called Neither Hope Nor Dread Attend from uh, W.B. Yeats' poem Death which contained horrific images of the calamitous con conservation project in Savile Park. And this is what you see here. This is where the growth of the elephant population went unchecked and tens of thousands of, in fact, say hundreds of thousands of elephants hemmed in by artificial boundaries died of starvation, constipation, and heart disease. 
and his shocking aerial photographs captured elephants running from nowhere to their death. And these skeletons of uh, herds of elephants, from baby elephants to fully grown elephants, are captured in this contact sheet here, which was found in Francis Bacon's studio. So the end of the game was a landmark publication, as much about human delusion as it was about li wildlife, and it caught the attention of both Warhol and Francis Bacon. Oh. Um, uh, Warhol was taken by, Bacon, by Beard's you know, capricious nature and exotic lifestyle, describing him as one of the most fascinating men in the world. He called his diaries, which he had, he always went around with a diary, and he carried them in his satchel, and uh, uh, Warhol called them his trip books. And these were kind of, if you like, compost heaps of everyday life, they're crammed with mementos, talisman, writings, drawings, body art, and photographs. If you cut your hand and, Warhol, and Beard was around, he'd put the diary out to sort of get the blood and put the blood in the, in the mix of uh, his, the pages of his diary. And you can see here in this diary, he got Andy to draw one of his hammer and sickles. But you see the thickness, they're really, really artist diaries. And, um, but they do show his um, a trace in, in Beard, that passionate uh, passion for a human experience. In 1970, about 70, two years after, uh, Bacon, after Warhol was shot, Bacon, Beard, sorry, referring back to Warhol's career as a successful commercial illustrator in the 50s and his early use of collage, proposed a collaboration on small electric, uh, eclectic subjects. Uh, one of them was sentences, but the other one was uh, uh, an introduction to the things of life. And this happened after some coaxing uh, with Warhol, who actually gave the title to the 20-page collage series. And these were created through, uh, during their Thursday night dinners in the Algonquin Hotel with Beard's cousin, Jerome Hill. And you see that they are uh, comprise newspaper cuttings, magazine images, advertisements, death notices, images of disaster, encircled by handwritten quips, philosophical quotes, and deadpan observations on the human condition. Re references to death and blood abound, and here and there are pop-up subjects featuring Andy Warhol's work, which I haven't included in there, but you can see the American dream down there, the greenback, the dollar bill, then um, you can see uh, uh, disaster over here with the, the airplane crash, the Rorschach, uh, blood for life. So uh, it, it was, Andy really enjoyed these working with Beard on this collaboration, which was um, uh, very interesting for him at the time, and he described it as a creative play period. Always on the move, Beard next went to London to coax another artist, Francis Bacon, Franny, as he called him, to work on his book on the Dead Elephant series, based on his photographs from uh, the, uh, the images of the skeleton, uh, skeletons of the elephants. Uh, Beard and Bacon met first in 1967 at Bacon's exhibition at the Marlborough Gallery. Bacon knew who Beard was immediately, and it was no surprise he had a copy of The End of the Game, given his extensive collection of books and loose leaves on American wildlife, which we found in the studio. Following on their first visit uh, meeting, Bacon regularly met the handsome American when he was in London. And by the early 70s, uh, Beard was both a friend and a muse. And between 75 and 80, Francis Bacon painted nine portraits of Peter Beard, including three triptychs and one diptych. Discussing photographs, Bacon alludes to their use as triggers, moving beyond the image to other meanings. They often trigger ideas. I mean, it releases one's sensibility, one's psyche, and all kind of images crowd into you from seeing this particular image. In the case of a decomposing elephant, the mind for the moment is taken off the elephant, and all kinds of imagery and suggestions enter. 99% of the time I find photographs are very much more interesting than either abstract or figurative paintings. I have always been haunted by them. Beard's concept for the book was to have image after image of elephants in various stages of decomposition. Repetition was an important factor for both Bacon and Beard and, of course, Andy Warhol. For Bacon, it induced an alternative consciousness or something he said sometimes like a, a trans-light state, uh, trans state, which was part of the creative process, as well as the sensation of seeing beyond the actual image, thus affecting a greater impact and deeper sensation. Warhol, of course, also recognized the power of repetition in transcending the specific and bringing new depth and meaning to the repeated image. My fascination with letting images repeat and repeat 
or in Thum's case, run on, manifests my belief that we spend much of our lives seeing without observing. And here we see um, a photograph of Bacon um, on the uh, roof of Narrow Street where he and Peter Beard were discussing the Dead Elephant book. And very often the long, slow exposures were of interest also to Andy Warhol. The camera was essential to Warhol's over and in the contact sheet was an important tool in his repertoire, as indeed it was in Bacon's. Warhol said everyone paints the same picture over and over again, which is probably true. Bacon, searching for that perfect image, encompasses all of his, con that would encompass all of his concerns, searched and searched throughout his career. Warhol, looking through and beyond the surface of his images to another reality, in this early portrait study with the reverse image uh, makes a later appearance in outer and inner space with the double image of Edie Sedgwick in that fabulous film which he made. In August 1972, Warhol invited Beard to his 44th birthday party at uh, Montauk. In one photograph, Beard captures a relaxed Andy out of doors holding his birthday gift from Truman Capote, his book, The Thanksgiving Visitor. In contrast, the photograph of Warhol indoors, Beard places him center stage, balancing a human skull on his right thigh without its lower jaw. Beard surrounds the image in an elaborate frame of uh, collage, small collages taken from mass media, rather like a predella panel on an early Renaissance altarpiece. The momentum mori suggested by the skull is underpinned by the photo, menage of, photo montage of images of dead elephants. In the 1970s, saw Warhol face down his own mortality. Before I was shot, which was in 1968, I always thought I was more, than, more half there than all there. I always suspected that I was watching TV instead of living life. And in 1976, he embarked on his series of skull paintings. He candidly credits Bacon's influence. I copy his color and his skulls. Bacon singled out Warhol's electric chair series and indeed his variations of colors on a single theme for praise. Both artists liked series, Bacon favoring the triptych despite its religious connotations and Warhol created multiples on a single theme. Some of the most memorable portraits by Andy Warhol and Francis Bacon are self-portraits, from the photo booth images to triptychs and multiples. They are looking at their own mortality, and indeed Bacon's face was, was described as almost as memorable and calculated as Andy Warhol's. In December 1972, Bacon sent Lucy and Freud a telegram, the only way of reaching, reaching him, most probably because the, his debtors from his gambling debts would follow him if they knew where he lived. He invited uh, Lucy to lunch in Wheelers and afterwards to see Warhol's film. Probably Bacon was, a, which was probably Heat, which was re uh, released in 1972. Bacon was a big fan of cinema and photo images of stills from diverse range of films were found in his studio. The silent scream of the nurse shot through the eye on the steps of, the, of Odessa from the battleship Pontenkin by Sergei Eisenstein was an influence for many of his uh, series of screaming popes. Uh, photo stills from Alan Resnay's uh, Hiroshima Mona Moore. Mona Moore. From, uh, stop, one second, sorry. So from um, uh, photo stills from, uh, photo stills from Bunuel's Lage d'Or and Chien d'Andalou, and from Alan Resume's Hiroshima Mon Amour were part of his film noir collection and manipulation creased and torn, feeding into his bank of images for his portraits. Warhol made more direct use of photographs of stills for his portraits. The still for Marilyn Monroe was from the film Niagara, and the basis for his photograph of Elizabeth Taylor uh, on this uh, as silver Liz was taken from a photograph in Life magazine during the filming of Cleopatra. Two years later, Andy Warhol and Francis Bacon met in Paris. Warhol stopped off in Paris on his way to Tokyo for his first exhibition in Japan. They both attended an a, reps a reception for David Hockney, uh, who had shown in the Palais de Louvre. 
Bacon was effusive um, in his congratulations to Andy Warhol when he met him. He singled out his films for particular plays, and in his films he singled out flesh. The erotically charged flesh charts the journey of Joe D'Alessandro's character, the hustler, atoned and muscular by sexual prostitutes through the murky underworld of uh, 1970s Manhattan. It is bleak, funny, and nonchalant, supported by a daring and often hilarious narrative. In one scene, the hustler is picked up by an older artist, not for sex, but to pose as a life model. As stoling aestheticism, he, he directs Joe into poses reminiscent of those in Edward Mybridge's The Human Figure in Motion, several of copies which Bacon had in his studio, and, um, in, and depicting motion in a static form was a constant interest to Bacon and to Warhol. Later, in 1975, copying Andy Warhol's film, he directed Peter Beard in similar poses. Warhol told Bacon that when he was Beard, they always talked about Bacon. Both Warhol and Bacon were attracted to Beard's experimental use of photography, his unique perspectives, and as well as his, what was known as his debonair morbidity and Darwinian persuasions. Warhol and Bacon met again in next year, 1975, in New York for Bacon's retrospective, Francis Bacon Recent P Paintings at the Metropolitan Museum. There was considerable excitement in Manhattan on that rainy Wednesday as people flocked to the museum party given in, uh, in Bacon's honor by Lee, Lee Radziwill. In a time when abstraction was uh, the dominant expression in the art world and homosexual relations were outlawed, the celebrated and defiantly homosexual, defiantly figurative painter from London drew the crowds. Many from the artist community came to pay homage, including William de Kooning, James Rosenquist, Jim Dine, and of course, Andy Warhol. The exhibition didn't disappoint, and despite Bacon's reservations about Henry Getzeller, uh, it was a very popular exhibition and, an ex and extended beyond July 4th and saw over 200,000 visitors attending. It consisted of 36 works, culminating a room with two haunting triptychs, triptych August 1972 and triptych May June 1973, created after the death of Bacon's former lover, George Dyer. The sanctity of sacrifice and the notion of momenti mori is a recurrent theme in both Bacon's work and in Andy Warhol's, who calls his work the death, he's even had what he called a death in America or a death and disasters period, series. Bacon's interest in the subject ranges from the Oristia trilogy by Escalade to Christian iconography. In the triptych format, harks back to medieval and Renaissance altarpieces. The movement is suggested by the shifting focus on the subject over the three panels like a film strip. Bacon has replaced the crucifer crucified Christ with the death of his lover and the life seeping out of his hollowed form as he dissolves into darkness. Their two triptychs are brutal, pitiless portrayals of sex and death, beautifully, almost tenderly portrayed in rich sepulcher palette. We don't know what Warhol thought of Bacon's exhibition, but no doubt he was aware of that sanctity of sacrifice that is a recurrent theme in Bacon's work. Warhol both feared and was fascinated by death. His work supply addresses the day steady stream of scenes of disaster and death supplied daily by mass media reportage on the underbelly of American society. Guns, uh, um, shooting, um, Birmingham race riots, electric chair. In response to the complacency of such consumption, Warhol transforms the media images into sublime commentaries on tragedy and trauma. Mechanically reproduced and painted over, cut, angled, and cropped, frequently manipulated into grids of glorious color, the effect of visceral response. Unlike Bacon, Warhol came from a devout Byzantine Catholic tradition whose churches are richly decorated with icons and isophilic images, where the panel paintings of Madonnas and saints are depicted against a gold leaf background. In Jackie Gold, which is in what we call Shomer Moore, the image is taken from the cover of Life magazine, and it's cropped and isolated against the gold background. Jackie, flanked by the <coughs> paratrooper, presents both as a devastated widow, a sacrifice, a sacrificial person, and a America's secular saint. 
So Bacon goes to John Richardson's party and again meets Warhol there, and again they talk about film. Bacon didn't want to meet any of the other artists that were in, in New York at the time. He just wanted to meet Warhol, and he enjoyed, they both were friends of John Richardson. But what he said and cannily recognized in Andy Warhol was Andy's new vision. He actually said to him, I admire your work, particularly your vision, but also your new vision, right? And coming <laughs> and uh, looking, um, so they just, uh, Andy invited him to the factory. And so the next day after John Richardson party, they go to the factory and um, Bacon, we don't know what they see, the ladies and gentlemen series has gone to Ferrara, but Bacon is very interested and they discuss painting. And he discusses, which is unusual, texture of painting and how painting is done. And so they, uh, this is a, as usual, and he takes uh, Polaroids of his celebrity visitor. And therefore, and also, he, we think he may have seen some of these 10 foot paintings of ladies and gentlemen, which weren't in the group that went to uh, Ferrara. But through their imagery, both Bacon and Warhol expressed the neurosis of their age, charting the unfolding dramas in one of the most turbulent, violent, and exciting centuries. Bacon's figures encapsulate the destruction of established society over the course of two horrific world wars, where the violence of man upon man necessitated a radical review of what it is to be human and the universal nature of existence. In Warhol's work, he confronts life, death, and celebrity through the accelerated consumption of mass media. As Peter Beard observed, Warhol was an idiot savant and Bacon was a fucking genius. Thank you. Thank you.